So today my topic, food and nutrition for glowing skin. So thank you for coming. So let's talk about food and nutrition for glowing skin. So when you talk about glowing skin, this is just a marketing. When Nishan asked, my friend asked me, what is the topic? I thought why not attract a good audience, but my marketing has a bit failed, but there's nothing called glowing skin. So this is something that we see everywhere in the world, especially when it comes to cosmetics and dermatology. Everybody's marketing things as glowing skin, which gives you a glow in the skin, glow in the hair, but there's nothing like that. You can get the glow depending on the makeup you wear. This is metallic glow, and this is a silvery glow, and there's natural glow as well. So today I'm going to talk about food and nutrition for healthy skin. So there are a lot to talk about um, when you talk about food and nutrition for healthy skin, but I will just um, focus on these few things, antioxidants, gut microbiome, supplements, especially collagen, and fasting, dairy, and there's something called ages, advanced glycation in products on your skin. So first we'll move into antioxidants because this is something very important when you talk about your skin. So um, what is an antioxidant? Antioxidants are helpful in reducing and preventing free radical damage in the body. So first we have to know what is free radical. So free radicals are unstable chemical species that, is, that are highly reactive. These free radicals often pulls an electrode of a neighboring molecule, causing the affected molecule to become a free radical itself. So what happens when there's free radicals? The free radicals induce a chain reaction. It damages the adherent, um, uh, the neighboring uh, molecule. Then again, the, the, that one also become a free radical. Then again, again, it is a chain reaction. In this way, this free radical damage can occur in DNA, proteins, lipids, and trigger number of human diseases, including cerebrovascular disease, cardiovascular disease, skin disease, and so on. You can go on talking about free radical damage. So how do you form the free radicals? Production of free radicals come in two forms. It could be due to your own metabolism. This is not something abnormal. You have your metabolism and the free radical uh, production is such something normal. But there can be exogenous ones like UV light, air pollution, ionizing radiation, smoking, and your own metabolism and inflammation can cause free radical uh, production. So there comes the concept of oxidative stress. We talk about this oxidative in many skin diseases and the human diseases and human aging as well. This is something very important when it comes to uh, human aging. So the term is used to describe the condition of oxidative damage resulting when the critical balance between the free radical generation and the antioxidant defense is unfavorable. So you have the free radicals, you have the antioxidants. Antioxidants are the ones which neutralize the free radicals. So when you don't have the proper antioxidant balance, what happens is there's oxidative stress and your skin, your organs, your cells are damaged. So you can see how free radical oxidative stress can damage your systems. It can affect your brain, causing Alzheimer's, Parkinson's, MS, heart, kidney, skin, multi-organ like joints and immune system, blood vessels, lungs and eyes. So free radical damage is everywhere if you don't balance the oxidative stress. So antioxidant is very important playing this uh, and utilizing this free radical. So antioxidant is a molecule that is stable enough to donate an electron to a rampaging free radical and uh, uh, neutralize it, thus reducing the capacity to the damage to cells. So these antioxidants can safely interact with free radicals and terminate the chain reaction before vital molecules get damaged. So what is the oxidative stress or redox imbalance in skin causes? So this redox imbalance on your skin can cause us many things. One is one um, very um, famous thing is oxidative stress causing skin aging. So this uh, oxidative stress in plays a major role in the aging process, both intrinsic aging and extrinsic aging. That you have your metabolism, you have the aging process on your uh, own uh, body, and it causes oxidative stress and intrinsic aging. Then outside also, it comes the UV radiation and toxins and everything causes aging. So signs of skin aging like fine lines, wrinkles, loss of elasticity and volume, and having a laxity, saggy skin, rough textured appearance, pallor, pigmentation, these are all signs of skin aging. So not only that, oxidative stress can bring out skin malignancies as well. So uh, another thing is that it exacerbates skin diseases like acne, vitiligo, and pigmentation. 
So when you talk about the antioxidants, there are a few types of an antioxidants. So there are enzymatic antioxidants and non-enzymatic antioxidants. So you can see some are, they are, uh, they are produ the production is there in your own body. Like there are some primary enzymatic ones, glutathione peroxidase, secondary enzymatic ones, glut um, likewise, uric acid and everything. Sometimes uh, there are things that produce in your own body. Some are like minerals and other uh, uh, antioxidants that you have to take from outside. So one comes with the glutathione and all something sometimes come uh, from your own body metabolism and it is produced in your um, uh, liver and other places. And then you have to take from the outside. So when you talk about the antioxidants, uh, if you take talk about fruit um, antioxidants, fruits are a very good source of antioxidants. So you can see um, the when you talk uh, when you take the antioxidant values that the goji berries are on the top. There's something very interesting about the goji berries. You know that Japan has a very uh, big amount of centenarians, like the people who have uh, past hundred years is more in Japan. The secret behind this is one secret seems to be goji berries that this is have this has a very good amount of antioxidants and it can play uh, neutralize their oxidative stress. So apart from these goji berries, you have the blackberries, raspberries, blueberries, and all kind of uh, berries. Apart from that, the things that we can find, pomegranate is there, and there's oranges, there's uh, other things like apples, bananas, like all. So you must be wondering, this, all the berries are having antioxidants. So how can we find the berries? Does Amazon sell berries? Does Dara sell berries? No, they don't have. But there's one way that we can get the uh, antioxidants by fruits. That is, I was fascinated to find this study done by the University of Pera, the Agriculture Department, where they have seen the nutritional compositions and antioxidant activity in the tropical food, fruits of Sri Lanka. So if you see, they have seen madang, ugurasa, Mahakaraba and Ceylon gooseberry. I have not heard it before. Ketamil it says, and the Barbados study something like little tomatoes and the Himudu. They have compared the antioxidant capacity with the uh, study which have done with the berries. So they have seen the antioxidant capacity of these our tropical fruits have more than a value of those berries. So nothing to worry. Just go to the out of the market and buy the from the little uh, sellers that it will help you oxidate your stress as well as the the uh, poor seller. So uh, when you talk about the Asian diet, it is very uh, rich on antioxidants. If you take cloves, cinnamon, oregano, turmeric, thyme, ginger, basil, parsley, uh, cumin, uh, all these things are very rich in antioxidants. So if you really uh, make our food at home and put in these um, spices, and if you make it in a healthy way that you have plenty of antioxidants in diet, you don't have to spend money on supplements. So I, when I was talking about this glutathione when I was talking about antioxidants. So I thought I would tell something about glutathione because this is a marketing hype these days. Everybody starting from the uh, girls coming from Kandy, Colombo, Waunia, and Radhapura, that everybody's coming and asking for glutathione. Dr. Injection and Gahanin at the, when I say no injections, they say that at least Dr. Petavadena. So what is this glutathione which everybody is talking about these days? So glutathione, as I told you, it is a very good uh, antioxidant in your body. So it is produced by the liver as well. So you can take it from the outside as well. So glutathione is called mother of antioxidant, a very powerful, a good uh, antioxidant if you have it in a natural way. So, you can see the roles of glutathione. Direct chemical neutralization of single oxygen uh, radicals, like single uh, singlet oxygens or hydroxyl radicals. And it is a cofactor for several antioxidant enzymes. Other than that, they, it is helpful in regeneration of vitamin like C and E. Even vitamin C and E, they are also very powerful antioxidants. So it causes neutralization of free radicals produced by the liver. And one, uh, then there's transposition of mercury out of the cells and the brain and regulation of cellular proliferation and apoptosis. So you can see that is a very good antioxidant glutathione. So when it comes to glutathione, we all have this question. How did they all of a sudden become fair? We don't know because there's nothing, nobody talks about it, if they have it or not. 
So the skin whitening effect of glutathione, the role of glutathione as a skin lightening agent was an accidental discovery when skin lightening was noticed when it is given for cisplatin toxicity. Actually, it was given as an um, anti-cancer drug, like when you have to give the cancer drug chemotherapy and to prevent the uh, side effects, they give um, uh, this glutathione, IV glutathione. So when you give IV glutathione, they have noticed there's some uh, complexion, fair complexion or complexion with the color reduction in this patient. So they use this as giving a whitening injection and there's various mechanisms for the hypopigmentary effect of the glutathione have been proposed with the inhibition of the tyrosinase being the most important. So they have seen some effect with glutathione then they use it as a skin whitening agent but all these are not officially, it is illegal at the moment in Sri Lanka and in an unprofessional day they use this IV glutathione as a skin whitening injection. So as you can see, when you talk about melanin synthesis, there are a few pathways of melanin synthesis. One is one enzyme involved is a tyrosinase enzyme. So glutathione inhibits this tyrosinase. That is the hypothesis. That is what we suspect how glutathione acts on skin whitening effects. So glutathione reduces tyrosinase enzyme. And then what happens? The eumelanin. Eumelanin is the one which causes dark brown pigmentation. So it reduces eumelanin pigmentation while increases pheomelanin. Pheomelanin is the one which causes yellow or like very orangish tinge in your skin. So reduces your mel you melanin and increase your melanin. So you get this yellow tinge somewhat. So if you want to really get the glutathione, you can really eat a good nutritious value. You can see the glutathione in your apples, asparagus, avocados, broccoli, and a lot of healthy vegetables, they have glutathione. So administration of glutathione in pharmaceutical formulations. There are three major routes of administration. One is cream, one is tablet, one is IV. So oral glutathione, what about oral glutathione? The bioavailability of oral glutathione in human is a controversial subject. We don't know whether even though you get the supplement giving so, so much money to the, uh, the pharmacy, you don't know whether it's available in our body. The inadequate absorption of glutathione in humans compared to the rats has been attributed to a higher hepatic activity in humans. And this results in increased hydrolysis of glutathione with result in low serum levels. So in summary, human trials performed shown that over-the-counter oral glutathione supplementation has a negligible effect on raising plasma levels in humans. The only trials which were uh, the support the concept of oral supplementation, which was done by Rajit et al. and Park et al., and they were sponsored by the glutathione production company. So they have said oral glutathione has a value in skin lightening effect, but we don't know what has happened inside, maybe true, maybe not. So thus the evidence for the clinically efficacious bioavailability for oral glutathione in hum humans remains scarce and controversial. But there are a lot of anecdotal reports. If you see in the internet, if you especially see the Indian articles, they are very proponents of this oral glutathione. Sometimes they even compare the oral glutathione with IV glutathione and say that there is uh, good effects with oral glutathione, but we don't know. We don't have the proper studies to show oral glutathione have an effect on your skin. The other thing is very, is very expensive. If you want to give the um, or a glutathione at least 500 milligram daily for about one month, you cost about 40,000 rupees if you go for a good brand. So this is not actually worth it for your skin whitening. So statutory approval for the status of glutathione supplementation. Glutathione-based oral dietary supplements have been granted at the status of generally recognized as safe by the FDA. And there's no restriction on its availability in US, Philippines, and Japan. This has recently become available over the counter in India as well. Usually it is considered as a nutritional supplement. So people get down into the amazing. So what is the current recommendation in Sri Lanka? Being the member of the cosmetic subcommittee that I know that our dermatologists were working hard on the, uh, bringing out the uh, consensus on these oral glutathione. So what we came across, the safe dose is 500 milligram daily for two months at a stretch. And then it, was, it is only prescription based. So in, uh, as dermatologists, we also use glutathione for some skin conditions like if it's a resistant melasma, resistant pigmentation. Sometimes I'd be used to give oral glutathione and see whether there's an improvement. If there's an improvement, we use to use it. Otherwise, we discontinue. So in glutathione injection, so-called whitening injections, what is the role of whitening injections? 
So due to the low bioavailability of oral glutathione, intravenous injections are being promoted to provide this higher therapeutic level in the blood and skin and to produce this instant skin lightning. So IV injections of glutathione have been used for years, but there's no even a single clinical trial evaluating its efficacy, proper single trial, proper, proper scientific trials, because most of the time it is given in an unprofessional way. It's given in salons, even the doctors give it, even in Sri Lanka, but they give it very secretly because not, this is not legal. So many touches of intravenous glutathione injection recommend a dose of 600 to 1,200 milligram for skin lightening to be injected once weekly to twice weekly uh, and then to continue as a maintenance dose. So although intravenous glutathione delivers a much higher therapeutic dose that enhances its efficacy, it also provides a narrow margin of safety due to the possibility of overdose toxicity. The data on safety are available, but scarce. And however, the adverse effects of intravenous glutathione have been documented from the Philippines. Philippines is the great market for the glutathione. Everybody's having glutathione there. So Philippine uh, Food and Drug Administration, FDA of Philippines, have issued a positional paper with public warning regarding the safety of this off label use of glutathione injection and adverse drug reaction reported from the use of intravenous glutathione. So they have mentioned that you can't use glutathione except for the cisplatin toxicity. So what they have seen, the adverse cutaneous reactions is a skin rash. Apart from that, they have seen the SJ, Steven Johnson syndrome and toxic epidermal necrolysis, thyroid dysfunction, kidney uh, dysfunction with potential development of renal failure, possibly due to high doses of intravenous glutathione overload in the renal circulation. The other thing is they give high dose of vitamin C with this glutathione because this glutathione to act, they need vitamin C. So they give vitamin C high doses with glutathione and you can get this uh, renal uh, stones and all and the renal problems. Apart from the adverse effects from the molecule, incorrect injection techniques by untrained staff may lead to lethal complications such as the embolism, potency of fatal sepsis. So even in Sri Lanka, if you search TikTok, there are so many people, uh, not even a nurse, uh, using this uh, glutathione IV, giving IV glutathione in their own salons. So other possible side effects, depletion of natural hepatic stores of glutathione. I told that you that you can have the glutathione as your natural antioxidant in your body. So when you gave it the, uh, from the outside, there is a chance that your natural glutathione source will deplete. This is hypothetical although. So this, uh, the other thing is exacerbation of helicobacter pylori because it is associated with um, as glutathione can improve the numbers and activity of macrophages. These peptic ulcers may be exacerbated because the helicobacter pylori is known to feed on macrophages and neutrophils. So there's another uh, known side effects and increased susceptibility for melanoma. We know our skin, we don't have many melanomas, we don't have many skin cancers because pigments in our skin, melanin uh, causes a protection from the sun. So when you have the reduction of your melanin, especially being in a tropical country like ours, there can be increased risk of melanomas and skin cancers when you suddenly uh, reduce your skin tone. So no single FDA approved drug for skin lightening at present. So other available supplements, grape seed extracts, astaxanthin, coenzyme, and vitamin C and E. So grape seed extract is a very popular few years back. So I was thinking, why can't we eat grapes and the seeds and get the antioxidant activity? Actually, get the, to get the uh, antioxidant activity of the grape seeds, you have to eat a lot of bag of, uh, like bag full of uh, seeds, and it doesn't have a good taste. So the grape seed, ex ex grape seed extracts are available as supplement. And then to talk about this astaxanthin, this is the, it is, uh, I really like to talk about astaxanthin whenever I talk about antioxidants in any conference because it is the most powerful antioxidant. It is known as the most powerful antioxidant in nature, the king of antioxidant. Not because only of that, I really like the story behind this antioxidant astaxanthin that it shows how beautiful your mother nature or the universal creation is. This astaxanthin is a carotenoid, which is found in various microorganisms and marine animals, including the shrimps, crabs, and salmon. If you see the pink to red color animals, or like uh, the crabs and uh, any algae or anything, that is due to the astaxanthin. So wild caught salmon is a very good source of astaxanthin, and unfortunately, this is not so available in Sri Lanka. So this is the la this interesting story. So if you, if you saw that the salmon was red in color, but actually the happening, the normal salmon is a white fish. So what happens is salmon's flesh is white from the time that is born in a river until it swims downstream to the sea. 
So when it is in the river, it is white. So it swims around the sea, it eats shrimps and other crustaceans, which are rich in astaxanthin, which gradually turns its flesh red. Crustaceans obtain it's by eating the algae. So algae are very good source of astaxanthin. So what happens is when they go to the, um, at the sea, they become the adult salmon. So salmon return to the free, uh, rivers from the sea, swimming back upstream to spawn. So the adults have to come back to the, uh, uh, the, uh, the rivers to spawn. So when they come in back, they have to flood, uh, swim against the flow. Thinking about the, again, swimming against the flow, that it needs a lot of energy, it needs a lot of power. So what is it is that what they get this power is from this antioxidants, so this free radical damage is neutralized from this astaxanthin, the antioxidants. So um, astaxanthins to serve as a source of energy when they set out their ardors journey, and they also need astaxanthin to protect their flesh from damage from the sun's rays that be down on the shallow waters at the banks of the rivers that the salmon traverse. So you can see how powerful this astaxanthin is. So we don't have uh, salmon much, so you can have the, the pink color uh, shrimps uh, if you want. So as you can see, astaxanthin seems to be very powerful and it protects uh, from the oxidative stress. And it says that it is very protect, uh, powerful than this uh, um, vitamin E, green tea extracts, coenzyme Q10, and it is called the king of antioxidants. So that is all about um, antioxidants. So the take home message is, if you want good antioxidants, get a plenty of good nutritional diet, especially green leafy vegetables and uh, the very colored vegetable, you call it rainbow colors. Like if you see, the, if you remember the, uh, the fruits I showed you, they were in very dark color, dark red, dark green, dark purple. So this redness, the pigments has the antioxidants and get good amount of leafy vegetables, uh, uh, green leafy vegetables and the fruits in your diet uh, in a way that you can get the antioxidant. The other thing is what it is said, if you want to get the proper antioxidant, you have to get the, um, the these leaves and all fruits and all which are grown in the outside. It says the polyphenols of the anti like uh, antioxidants are more in when they are grew, uh, when they are grown in outside, like when they are exposed to sun, when they are exposed to sun, when they are bitten by the insects, so that they have the very good amount of polyphenols, not the greenhouse one. So try to make uh, the good healthy organic ones at your own garden if possible. Possible. So the next topic that I really want to highlight regarding your skin health and the uh, food and nutrition is your gut microbiome and skin. So when you talk about gut microbiome and skin, there's something called gut skin axis. So what is this gut skin axis? It is the bi-directional relationship between the gut microbiome and the skin health. So what is gut microbiome? So if you take the human digestive tract, associated microbes are referred to the gut microbiome and GI tracts at 100 trillion bacterial population. So you are not living alone. There are thousands, trillions of other people, other microbes in your gut. So uh, if you take the genetic stand of plant point, that if you take the genetic collection gene pool, you are only 1%, less than 1% uh, human. You are more than 99% microbial. So they play a big role in your life. They play a big role in your health. So we always talk about gut dysbiosis when it comes to uh, human health. So what is gut dysbiosis? Dysbiosis is disruption to the microbiome resulting in an imbalance in the microbiota. It could be altered microbacterial uh, ratios or metabolic activities, a shift in their local distribution. So we call it gut dysbiosis. So um, the gut microbiota is an environmental factor that regulate that fat stores. So I want to talk about this study, a study done in around 20 years ago in a medical school of uh, science at St. Louis, USA, which was a real eye opener on this microbiota to both scientists and the communities. Because this is one uh, um, uh, hallmark study, benchmark studies that has uh, uh, made the attention to the gut microbiota even 20 years back. So what they have done was there were that obese mice and there were that lean mice. So microbiota from the mice was transplanted to the mice that haven't got any microbiota at all. We call it germ-free mice. So you get the uh, microbiota, microbiome from the fat mice and you put it into the germ-free mice. 
And the other hand, you get lean mice microbiome and put it in the germ-free mice. Other than that, all these mice were treated identically, food, water, sleep, and exercise. So what they found is surprising. What they found was that the mice that received the obese microbiota increased the body fat as twice, much as, uh, as twice as much as the mice that received lean microbiome. So lean microbiota causes lean mice, fat microbiota causes fat mice. So you can see how powerful and how they affect the uh, metabolism of rats, uh, vice versa in humans as well. So what are the functions of gut microbiome? We think the microbiome always, when you talk about uh, bacteria, we think they are bad. No, they are very important in our health. So what are the functions of gut microbiome? So it in, uh, influences our nutrition and metabolism, and it is important in neuroendocrine function and immunomodulation. So nutrition and metabolism, fermentation of the carbohydrates, synthesis of short chain fatty acids, such as butyrate, propionate, and acetate, and they have imparted a positive impact on lipid metabolism, and they involve in synthesis of vitamin K and several components of vitamin B. So when it comes to the neuroendocrine function, I was fascinated to see this, that they secrete many neurotransmitters, including the happy hormones, serotonin, and dopamine, adrenaline, and GABA. So serotonin, when you talk about serotonin, it's called the happy hormones. And if you are to say that your 95% of serotonin in your body is not produced in your brain, it is produced in your gut associated with this microbiota. So you can see how important your gut microbiome is. So 95% of serotonin is produced in your gut. Then there's, if you talk about these things, then you can have the gut brain axis, gut liver axis, and gut uh, lung axis, and it can cause anxiety, pain, autism, multiple sclerosis, and cardiovascular risk as well. So it involves in your immune system as well. When there's this spice, it, it reduces the mucus layer, which results in passage of microbiomes through the intestinal barrier. So you call it like leaky gut. You may have heard it's all, all over the world, like leaky gut. I have leaky gut when the people do the uh, YouTube videos in other countries. So this will lead to B-cell hyper-response units, impaired T-cell differentiation and immune dysregulation. So how does gut microbiome affect the skin? So production of various metabolites and chemicals and modulating immune response, it uh, does affect your skin. So skin diseases associated with gut dysbiosis, biases, uh, acne, atopic dermatitis, psoriasis, rosacea, and many of the chronic inflammatory disorders, and seborrheic dermatitis, dandruff, alopecia areata, and the old, most of the old autoimmune ill diseases like SLE, including, and not the simple ones, even the melanoma is associated with gut dysbiosis, and the vitiligo and beshe as well. So how does gut dysbiosis causes acne? The connection between the gut microbiota and the acne development could be related to the fact that the bacterial dysbiosis in the gut cause increased intestinal permeability, the leaky gut, and then inflammatory mediators are reduced, uh, produced and the endotoxins into the circulation leak and leading to alteration of the skin microbiome and inflammation. So there are studies showing that there's uh, gut dysbiosis in acne patients. So if you talk about active, uh, atopic dermatitis, there's gut dysbiosis, psoriasis, gut dysbiosis. So dandruff, even the dandruff, seborrheic dermatitis, rosacea, gut dysbiosis, SLE, gut dysbiosis. So you have this immune dysregulation in SLE patients. So alopecia areata and is also that you call so undergo vocava, this even this is associated with gut dysbiosis. So I show you this interesting, this is a very famous uh, case report among dermatologists. Uh, so you can see the hair growth in two alopecia patients after fecal microbiota transplant. So this patient has a recurrent Clostridium difficile infection. So what they did was uh, the uh, fecal transplant for this patient. So after that, they have seen the growth of the hair in this patient. So I'm not sure whether I'm correct, but uh, if my GI colleagues are present that they can correct me, it is said the fecal microbial transplant is one of the most uh, effective treatment for the Clostridia difficile recurrent infections. So you can see there's some growth in this patient, but there's market growth in this patient. So after the reading this, I was so fascinated about this miracle poop and I searched about it. So what you do in the miracle poop is fecal microbial transplant. That fecal microbiota transplantation is a novel uh, method to re-establishing gut microbiota. It allows long-term alteration of the recipient's microbiome, whereas treatment with probiotic results just temporary colonization. 
So this, if you uh, search the YouTube, you have the DIY do it yourself at uh, videos in the YouTube, how you get a, a poop from a healthy patient and blend it in a blender and drink it in the morning as a smoothie. So I'm not joking, there are uh, fresh fecal samples from the healthy donors are taken and processed and centrifuged to, the, to make capsules or enemas. So if you really go abroad, if you are buying a, a secondhand blender, be careful. So uh, there's this clinical efficacy of fecal microbial transplantation uh, treatments in adults with moderate to severe atopic dermatitis. There are case studies that have shown that the microbiome or the fecal transplant is very effective. If you see the A and B is the pre and post transplant, you can see that A has some eczema condition and the B after four fecal transplant, it has improved uh, uh, significantly. So this is another study which showed that gut microbiota restoration through fecal microbiota transplantation is a new therapy for atopic dermatitis. So if you see this uh, a murine study, you can see in the A picture before FMT and the after FMT. So you can see how the skin has improved. And if you see the biopsies that you can see that the mast cells have reduced. So, the, so this could be in our treatment in the future. So safety and efficacy of fecal microbiota transplantation in the systemic lupus epidosis. So you can even uh, treat, uh, you can try treating SLE patients even with these fecal or food transplants. So what I want to say is it's not just acne, it's not just atopic dermatitis, even the conditions like melanoma is associated with uh, this uh, microbial this, uh, this biosis and you can overcome this with fecal microbial transplant it seems. So how to make your bugs happy? How do you keep? How do you keep a friendly environment in your gut? So what advices that we can give is you have to flow with the nature. It is said that when you are in your tummy, the mummy's tummy, that you are in a sterile environment, ster relatively sterile environment. So the first microbiome induction or introduction to your body happens when you come through the mommy's vaginal canal. So the mother's vaginal canal get ready to uh, deliver the baby with the, all those good bacteria, lactobacillus and all. So when you go through the, uh, the vaginal, the, you call it microbial baptism, it says that uh, first introduction happens with this uh, vaginal delivery. So now what happens, you go, don't go for the vaginal delivery, go for the cesarean section. So what happens, it is not ideal for the baby. It is not the ideal bacteria who gets into the baby's uh, system and develop the immunity. It's the skin of the mothers or the handlers microbiota getting exposed to the baby. So one way to get into the good microbiome is the flow with the nature. Then the breastfeeding, then you introduce them good bacteria to mother, then let them play, eat dirt, I don't know, uh, like go in the, uh, the nature and play and get your immune functions properly with this playing in the uh, nature and also go with the um, nature. So the other thing is there are three F's for the um, good gut microbiome. That is one is um, fiber fridge food, the other thing is fermented food, and the other thing is fasting. So these are, seems to be, there are studies showing you can get, have friendly, your microbiota is positively affected with these three things, especially fiber-rich food, because your, the, the, the fiber is the food. Uh, the, 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 your microbiota live on your, the, the complex carbohydrate that you eat. We saw some, uh, like some uh, discussions in previous months or weeks that, that you don't, somebody is saying that you don't need to eat any fiber. You can just live on uh, meat or only on meat. But to remember, it's, the fiber is not only for your constipation. It is for your microbiota. They need fibers. They need complex carbohydrates to grow. That is how they live on. So you have the fiber-rich food, green leafy vegetables and leaves and all these vegetables with uh, or the complex carbs, uh, then you can go for the fermented food. So if you happen to come to my clinic, you will see that I'm telling my patients, like coming with the psoriasis, atopic dermatitis, um, so what is the what is the secret behind the abat? The abat is again a uh, the fermented food. So especially people, the elderly women get very impressed with me. And uh, so the beer bath is one way you can consume fermented food. So I was doing this lecture in one of my dermatology conferences. So one of my, not my colleagues, a very senior consultant who I really respect. And for a joke, she asked uh, whether we can get her, we can drink raw to get fermented food. Like, I don't know whether you can search whether raw has a good uh, microbiome in it, whether it's a very good source of fermentation. So uh, the other thing is, um, 
the fermentation, the other thing is the curd. I don't think uh, uh, the yogurts in Sri Lanka is a good source of fermented food because it has a lot of sweet, a lot of uh, sugars in it. So curd, what I tell my patients is take the apath at least three times a week and eat curd without sugar. So uh, this way that we can try to restore the good microbiota in your gut. So the fasting, mm, and the fasting also seems to be increase your good microbiota and the exercise, sleep, and rest, uh, the stress reduction. If you talk about sleep, it is very important because it is said that this your microbiota in your gut is also very sensitive to circadian rhythm. Okay, now another topic, dairy and acne. So what is the take home message with the dairy and acne? So any uh, we have seen that, uh, we have seen the articles, we have seen the studies that dairy increases your acne. So uh, there are uh, studies done, proper studies done, saying that intake of dairy products, including full fat dairy, uh, dairy and uh, whole milk and low fat skim milk and yogurt, cheese, those things are associated with uh, increased acne production. So the topic is controversial, why the dairy is increasing your acne. It says that it has growth hormone. Obviously that the milk has growth hormone for the baby cow. And apart from that, in the industrial production, they used to give the growth hormone. It seems, it is said that they give the growth hormones to the cows to increase the, uh, the, the growth. So that what happens is that your milk has the growth hormones, which in, uh, insulin like growth factors, and in turn that increases your androgen, androgen production and uh, increase your acne. So when my uh, um, the acne patients come. What I used to tell is, if you want to really drink milk, just milk, uh, drink it in the morning with a few uh, tablespoons, one or two, or two or three, and just that, not dairy uh, instead. But they can eat uh, curd. Curd, it seems, have the less amount of growth uh, factors because the fermentation reduces the growth factors, it seems. So there were studies saying skimmed milk is worse than the whole milk when it comes to um, acne, because they, we don't know actually why, but it is said that the high glycemic index could be a reason and the more consumption and lack of skin friendly fatty acid in skim milk. So if you want to drink, drink whole milk, organic whole milk, organic if you can't, but just whole milk, and then uh, not the skim milk. So what are ages? So advanced glycation in products are ages. We call it advanced glycation in products. So ages can form within the body and also exist in our food. The formation of ages is a part of normal metabolism, but if excessively high levels of ages are reached in tissues and the circulation, they can become pathogenic. So when in excess, they are known to continue to increase oxidant stress and inflammation. So what are the ages food? Like how do you get the advanced glycation end product? If you eat high fat, high sugar processed food and you have the high glycemic state all the time, that is high sugar, high starch, you are prone to glycate your skin, uh, glycate your uh, uh, proteins. Like you are cooking yourself. Each time think that you uh, take a French fries very fried in a very, a very, very oily manner. And uh, if you are uh, getting these things and a very sweet, uh, especially when the, high starch uh, cooked with the high fat, you get the ages. So you are, it's like you're cooking yourself in an oven each time you are uh, eating those things. It's like we call it a glycation, your proteins are destroyed. So not only the food with high starch, um, especially processed starch, not all the high starch, processed starch, high fat and high sugars, the way you cook uh, is also important bringing down the ages. Like, Fried and grilled has more than the uh, boiled and raw uh, food ages. Ages are fr uh, high in grilled and fried food. So, so you can limit this food to uh, limit your glycation. So what happens is when you have the sugars and all these glycation products, your glycation reaction happens and the dermis, the proteins, collagen and elastins uh, break down. So there's cross-linking of collagen bundles and they get uh, destroyed. So this is what happens, excess sugar molecules bound to proteins such as skin collagen and elastin forming ages and inflammation and dryness. So if you come to, uh, if when, when, as a dermatologist, when a diabetic patient comes, if, if they have a very poor sugar control, looking at the patient without even uh, seeing their uh, records, we can say that patient has diabetes because their skin is lusterless. It's a very pale dryness. So you looking at their skin, you can say that this patient has a poor diabetic control. So you can see how your food, how your metabolism affect your skin. So what about the collagen supplements on skin? I thought about talking it because everybody's asking about collagen supplements. 
So uh, collagen is the most abundant component of the extracellular matrix, constituting 75% 75, 75 of the skin. And qualitative and quantitative decline in collagen is associated with cutaneous aging. So you can see your younger skin, how smart it is, and all these collagen, and it lasting in a very nice manner. But when you age, that your collagen elastin get destroyed or reduced. So what are the scientific evidence? So if you Google through the Google Scholar or PubMed, you can see there are a lot of studies on this collagen uh, supplementation. But really, we need proper studies with real randomized double bind, very uh, like large scale studies. We have small, small studies. So studies have shown that oral collagen supplements increase skin elasticity, hydration, dermal collagen density, and collagen supplementation is generally safe with no reported adverse effects. So among these supplements, hydrolyzed collagen is the most popular and promising skin anti-aging nutraceutical. And the dose, there are no official guidelines, but says 2.5 to 10 gram. So as you see, there was systematic analysis, meta-analysis, uh, which was done on collagen, where they have compared all the studies and they have analyzed the studies and show that collagen supplementation can be beneficial to your skin. So this is another study, likewise, which has done collagen supplementation and skin aging. So um, when I when somebody asked me to take, is it okay to collagen? As it does not, it, it hasn't shown any significant side effects. Uh, but I say, if the patient has the money to spend for the collagen, it's okay to get the collagen, especially hydrolyzed form in a powder form. That is the most available, uh, the bioavailable form, hydrolyzed powder form of the collagen. And if you see in the market, there are a lot of powders, but they have the sweetness. So if you buy a collagen, make sure that you buy a collagen with, without artificial sweetness. Like these sweetness tend to destroy your gut microbiome and uh, says that it increases your satiety, in, it increases your cravings for the sugars. So make sure that it does not have um, sweetness. Get the pure hydrolyzed form of collagen. So what I tell patients is take collagen and if you have money, take collagen and see if you see any um, difference in your skin, then you can take it in intervals. Usually it is said you can continue at a stretch for about three uh, months uh, in one row. So uh, fasting on skin. So being a big hardcore fan of fasting, I was delighted to see these studies on fasting and skin. Uh, so um, there are studies which have shown intermittent time-restricted circadian fasting modulates cutaneous severity of dermatological disorders, that including the uh, inflammatory disorders, psoriasis, uh, eczema, acne, that it says that the intermittent fasting can um, uh, reduce the skin inflammation. So there's another study of Journal of American Academy of Dermatology where it is shown skin disorders and severity decrease at the month of Ramadan due to the fasting. And there's this another uh, uh, study which was uh, shown that 45 healthy patients, uh, they have a I have the 45 patients in their study and it has shown improved skin roughness, hydration, density, and skin barrier health after fasting. So what happened? How do the fasting affect your, uh, how does the fasting affect your skin? It says that the fasting uh, can reduce your insulin uh, sensitivity and increase, uh, reduce the glycation. Like I was talking about the advanced glycation end products or so the advanced glycation uh, end products are also re uh, reduced. The other way is something called autophagy that you know the autophagy was very popular a few years back where the Nobel Prize was won by the, uh, the scientific, this autophagy was um, uh, introduced to the world so a uh, world so autophagies during the fa fasting period the cells go into a renewal mode called autophagy where cells remove the damaged cell components so detoxify and rejuvenation of skin cells happen reduce inflammatory markers and oxidative stress so what is the time interval the sweet point for the fasting for skin it is said 12 40 hours, 8 hours allowing the cells to rejuvenate without causing malnutrition. You can go for 24 hours once a week or 40 hours once in a while. So chronic fasting is not advisable because the chronic fasting can negatively impact on skin health by nutritional deficiencies, dehydration, and sleep deprivation. So this can lead to decreased collagen production and poor wound healing. So what I do is I have a clinic on Friday morning. So what I do is I straightly come to the clinic in the morning without taking anything. So uh, I eat Thursday like about around 7, uh, 7 p.m. Uh, my last meal. So then I wait until my clinic uh, finishes. 
I go home around two to four o'clock, so I complete about 80 to 20 hours plus two a week. So you can try one day a week. You don't have to go for 20 hours at the stretch. You can start from 12 hours, then go to 16 hours. Do, do it at least once in a week. It's really good for the skin. It is not just cell. It is um, shown in the uh, studies as well. So the secret for healthy skin, there's no miracles. No, it's not a miracle in your supplementation. It's not about the injection. It's your healthy diet. Healthy diet is the secret to your glowing or whatever the healthy skin. So thank you very much. And thank you for coming. <laughs>